through 19, 25 through 30. It can also be found in your bulletin. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her needs. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and, heavy, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word of the Lord. Good morning, friends. It's really a joy to be able to worship with you. Uh, I look forward to this. It's not an annual tradition, but it seems to be about on average that once a year I get to worship with you on a Sunday morning, in addition to Easter morning. And um, I'm particularly always blessed by the music. So thank you for, along with everyone, um, helping me turn my heart to God this morning. As we, prepare to, as we prepare to sort of think about these verses we've just heard, let's pray together and ask that we have the full benefit of the Holy Spirit in doing that. Gracious God, we... Thank you so much for all of the literal pains you have taken to reveal yourself, for all of the handiwork in creation. We wake up this morning and we hear those birds singing and we look out and we see another, what feels to us like a perfect summer day. We thank you for those blue skies and growing things that tell us something about your beauty. We thank you, God, for the the pains you have taken to be revealed in Jesus Christ, born a baby, Jesus who has gone to the cross, Jesus who has risen from the grave. Um, we thank you for all that we know of you in Jesus. That is an amazing and profound gift, and we praise you. And Lord, we thank you for the scriptures, all of those pages, hundreds and hundreds of pages, um, reflecting your revelation over centuries. Help us to receive all of these as gifts and to glimpse you and to know you better in them this morning. And God, we pray by your grace and by the power of your Holy Spirit that this day we would be encouraged to be drawn close to you, closer to you uh, because of this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, if you look at that passage that we've um, just heard that uh, you have in the bulletin there, um, it's the lectionary passage today that's the gospel passage that many churches around the world this morning are listening and reflecting on. And you might notice that um, those who piece together the lectionary prayerfully um, have included uh, verses 16 through 19 along with 25 through 30. There's a little gap there. It's not really long. But I thought that was kind of curious. There are many times I've heard and meditated on those really beautiful words, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We love those words. In fact, we were at a family funeral two weeks ago, and that was the text my mother-in-law wanted our sons to read. And so those are beautiful verses we might even know by heart. But I had never really studied them along with the stuff that comes before. So when I sat down and started studying, I thought, this is curious, and I'm so glad for this exercise because um, it's opened my eyes to some things that God wants for me and for God's people that I'm eager to share with you this morning. Um, one of my simplest and most trustworthy means of Bible study has been just three questions we can bring to any Bible text. One, what does this passage tell us about God? What does it reveal about who God is, how God is? Second, what does this passage reveal about me or us as human beings, as humanity throughout the centuries? And third, what does it tell us then about the relationship between God and between us? Three really simple questions. 
and they have never failed me. What do I learn about God? What do I learn about myself or about us? And what does that tell me about our relationship with God? So it's going to be as simple as that this morning as we look, work through this passage. And we'll actually even get simpler. We'll work through this passage. We'll start with those first couple of verses that are set off um, uh, as an introduction uh, for those who be selectionary together. And this passage tells us something about humanity, something about how we can be. And um, Jesus starts out, uh, what shall I compare to what shall I compare this generation? But really, what he starts to talk about then, I think, is not just about that generation. I think he's talking about sort of a timeless condition since way back in the Garden of Eden, um, ever since humanity first said, oh, forget those evening walks with God and the cool in the garden. <laughs> forget him telling us what to do. We can eat what we want. We can be wise and we can judge things uh, without him, apart from him. Um, that was the original sin, if you will, that sort of gives us a feel for what it means for us to turn our back on God and choose our own way. And that's kind of been the struggle ever since, um, really, that distancing ourselves from God and becoming our own judges in God's place, even maybe judging what God does. And that's trickled across through the centuries in the human condition. And it pulled forward to Jesus' day when people looked at Jesus and they rejected him as the Messiah. And they said, no way. This is not what we were expecting. This is not what we wanted. Uh, you're not running through our agenda. You have this wild other agenda. No, uh, not the Messiah. So um, if we look closely at those uh, few, first uh, few verses, we see a couple of examples there um, of that generation, which was and is. Um, first of all, they start talking about um, John the Baptist and the criticisms that had emerged of John the Baptist. First of all, when he started out on his public ministry, he really drew a lot of interest. He was quite popular. He was a colorful figure. You know, you think about that. He was eating locusts and wild honey and out there wearing belts made of hair. And folks thought it was pretty curious. And if it were today, he would probably get his own reality TV show <laughs> because it was fascinating viewing to see what this character was doing. So uh, lots of fascination and even some folks showing up you know, to sort of test the waters, literally test the waters, the baptism of John, and see what, this, what was going on. But it didn't take long before the table started to turn. And what started out as sort of this uh, grudging admiration for this holy man, sort of extreme in his practices, um, started to turn into criticism. And maybe that had something to do with John's message, when he was calling people to repentance, he was calling them out on stuff that was not life-giving. Um, suddenly, the chatter started to be, oh, how fascinating, to, wow, I think he might be demon-possessed. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. I think he might be even demon-possessed. Um, and really wrote him off and distanced themselves from John, his ministry, and his message in that way. So suddenly, he was just a character to criticize, to talk about in the tabloids um, as uh, had been possessed, if you will. So then, there was Jesus. And I don't want to say he was the opposite of John, but his was a very different story, right? He wasn't eating locusts and wild honey. He was showing up at a party, sitting down, eating, feasting, turning the water into wine. Um, he was hanging out with those on the fringes. I really love the story earlier in Matthew when it talks about him uh, being criticized by the Pharisees for eating with the tax collectors and sinners. And when I think of that story, I think about it as with all the neighbors saying, whoa, there are way too many cars parked on that lawn, and the lights are on way too late. And what in the world is going on? And what is he doing? What is he doing? And so Jesus got criticized for that, for eating too much and drinking too much with them, for having those lights on till all hours. And because he was hanging out with people who made the Pharisees feel uncomfortable, the gossip and the criticisms and judging just flew. Um, so people were griping from both ends, and they were making their distance. They were stepping back, making their distance from John. They are stepping back, distinguishing themselves from Jesus, from that guy, and drawing further 
away. So this is one of the things we learn in this passage, these very first few couple of examples. Um, those folks made it clear they weren't crazy religious extremists like John or lushes or gluttons like Jesus. They judged, they criticized from on high because it's easier to do that than to be open to and be challenged by John's call to repentance or Jesus' radical gospel that offers a new way of life to anyone who receives it. And if this is one snapshot of the human condition, it really was tragic that they stepped back instead of stepping forward and following and joining John and Jesus. This is what we learn about the human condition in this snapshot. When we're uncomfortable, when we're challenged, very often instead of embracing that personal change, we step back and we build ourselves up to become the critic instead. We see this in middle school. I hear it from my kids. What are they going to say about my clothes? What are they going to say about my hair? How are they going to criticize my sense of humor? It's not quitty, uh, clever, or sarcastic enough. Um, they start to become critics of each other to build themselves up. And we all know when we're working with 13-year-olds, don't do that. That's just about all of your insecurities. That's not really about strength, but still. Kind of have to move through that phase of being tempted to that, building ourselves up at the expense of others. I see it in families when it's easier to blame and walk away than to enter into the relationship and the struggle. We see it in the world every time we morph into the consumer. <clears throat> and this is so easy because I think we're groomed for this in our society that we all think we're, this is, here's a reference for older folks, we all think we're Siskel and Evers. <laughs> It's our life's mission to give everything a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, and so uh, it's easy to run around and think, oh, what do I think of this soundtrack? Or what do I think of that plan? Or what do I think of that outfit? Or what do I think of the restaurant meal? Thumbs up or thumbs down. It actually even happens with worship. And preachers are the worst because it's easiest for us, easy for us to sit there and say, oh, wow, um, I think that this song could be done this way. Or the sermon is missing an application step. Or, this portion should be mic'd so that we can hear the children's song or whatever it is. Um, and this, I, for someone who goes to chapel up to four days a week at <laughs> UD, um, I have to really be aware of that and to step back. And I really love for our seminary chapel services, our debriefing questions we've orchestrated in a really specific way to save us from that. So instead of saying, hey, was the service good or bad? Did you like the song or dislike the song? The question that we start with was, what was God saying to you? So that's the question. And I need that question. So when I'm sitting in chapel, I'm listening for how God's speaking to me rather than distancing myself from God, thinking about the sound system or what graphics we chose or whatever. So human condition. We distance ourselves sometimes instead of drawing close to God. Second. Uh, we look at the next couple of verses that tell us something about who God is. I'm gonna, I'll reread that little portion for you. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father. He's, he's the, listen to these names he calls them. Thank you, Father, and Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding, and you've revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. All right, so this portion, we hear that Jesus is revealing things about God, and he's also talking about how God is revealed or made known to us. <clears throat> and I really think that's important, how Jesus reveals God from the very outset when he calls him Father and Lord of the universe. Put those two things together, Father and Lord of the universe. And, and when we stop and we think about that, it's really amazing. It's amazing. We have this God who is sovereign, all holy, all powerful, and yet we have this God who wants to be called Daddy by us. And this is one of many examples of why I believe the scriptures and why I believe the gospel, because nobody could make this stuff up. Nobody would construct a God who's going to be all sovereign and wants to be daddy to us and finds a way to make that all possible at the same time. 
So already Jesus is revealing something about the kind of God that we have. And we learn something about the relationship between God and Jesus. When Jesus um, talks to him about this has been revealed to me and God knows me and I know God and I make the Father known to others. They're, they're distinct, Father and Son, and yet they have this depth of communion, all things in common, the same mission, the same goals. It, it is the word communion at its very best, at its very deepest. And so we learn here something about how we get to see God. And it has to do with that communion, about Jesus being the one to say, here, I'm in this intimate relationship with my Father. Come and join us in this circle. I make the Father known to you. I'm holding out my hand. Join me in this relationship, in this communion. And so um, we learn about how we see God, but we also learn about how we don't see God by what follows uh, when he talks about God has hidden these things from those who are wise and knowledgeable, and God's revealed these things to little children. And at first that might sound kind of neat, mean, like why would God hide things from people? Um, I remember our um, older son, when he was about six, we were praying one night, bedtime prayers, and afterwards he asked me, he says, you know, is the reason why I, and he asked this with complete sincerity, he says, is the reason why I can't see God because he's always standing behind me? And it's a very honest question, as if, because I'm always telling him, oh, God is with you. God is, goes with you to school. God is with you. So why can't I see him? Is he always right behind me? Like, turn around fast enough, and maybe you'll catch him. And that's a very fair question. I think all of us have that question, right? We have time to say, where is God? <laughs> I want to perceive, experience the presence of God. And so is this like God's playing games with us here? When Jesus talks about God's hidden these things from the wise and the knowledgeable. Well, not really. Rather, I'd like to suggest that hiddenness of things is directly related to the degree to which people choose to remove themselves from God. That stepping back, that becoming judge, the looking down to critique, the I'll take the fruit and be wise myself. Thank you very much, God. Um, can you sort of start to see that natural relationship when we step back and decide to see things for ourselves? God leaves us to see things for ourselves, which is such narrow vision. Um, the irony is suddenly we stop seeing a lot of things. And I've been thinking about this this week, how very often um, the view from on high can be a really limited view. Uh, I, I know there is something between getting the big picture and having a bird's eye view of things, but I, I also have been noticing how very often that means you miss the detail, and maybe even you miss the meat of things when you step that far back. And so here's just a very common couple of little illustrations. One of them is we have in our backyard, in the back of our property, a raspberry jungle. And I'm sure that our neighbors who are uphill from it and look down on it really do think it's a raspberry jungle. And I know I need to thin them down this next year. But I make raspberry jam, and I really love getting as many raspberries as I can out of that jungle. <clears throat> and so I thought about this. Um, my parents were visiting last weekend, and my dad was helping to trim some things in the yard. And he said, you know, I think you're only going to get one batch this year. I looked out there, and there's just not that many raspberries left. And I said, well, you know, it is what it is. Uh, maybe we'll get some more in October. But I went out there this week each day. And you know how it is if you've ever picked berries. You start looking in there, and wow, here's a whole little cluster. And, wow, there's this whole section there that's like nearly hanging on the ground, and there's a bunch more. And suddenly I have five cups in the fridge right now. If I get one more cup, I have another batch ready to can. But it took some getting in there and stepping closer rather than just looking across the yard saying, whoop, I don't see any red. You know, I think we're done for the season. Another little example. Um, I've done this before. Uh, so, like, uh, drop the contact lens on the kitchen floor. And I have to tell you, it does not work to stand there and look at the whole floor like this for it. Here's, here's the tip. Here's the best tip if you drop your lens on the floor. If you lay down on the floor with your eye level to the floor, and suddenly all this stuff appears that's on your floor in addition to the contact lens. Um, so the getting close, the getting close, 
suddenly starts to reveal things that I would not have noticed if I stayed distant and looking from on high. So, revelation is closed to those who remove themselves. That's uh, not a surprising form of justice, if you will, but it's open to those who draw near. So those who stop listening to John the Baptist and indul instead indulge in those tabloid speculations, started ridiculing that he was demon-possessed, they became deaf to his message. They really couldn't hear what he was saying anymore because they were too busy talking about eating locusts or whatever they're talking about. And the same thing with those who stop studying Jesus' way of life and instead started of chattering about who showed up at that party that he was at. They became blind to what Jesus was revealing with how he lived his life. And so, um, that judgment of God's hiddenness is in a way entirely fitting because when we remove ourselves from Jesus' presence, we're not going to be able to see. On the other side, <clears throat> there's another kind of children that they talk about here. The children to whom God reveals things. And here he's talking about children in a positive sense. Those who are willing to learn. Those who understand they're still in their growing years. Those who will be guided and challenged and formed. Those who want to get close to Jesus and be grown in this way, thereby see God. Suddenly it's all opened up when they draw that close and they're willing to be vulnerable to that call. And so this gets to the kind of God that we have. A God who doesn't want us to be distant and a God who desperately wants us to draw near a God of communion. This God, first and foremost, wants us to be in a close relationship with him. Jesus wanted his disciples, not because he was looking for being built up by having a little band of followers to do what he said. Jesus wanted his disciples to be with him, to go to the lake shore, to pray to the Father together, to share in a mission, to share life and hope together. He wasn't looking for servants. He was looking for friends and a spiritual family. Again, what an amazing God we have, that this God wants a spiritual family. He wants us to be his spiritual family. He wants us for the sake of love. And our sin, that separation we make, that aloofness, our rebellion, yes, those are an offense to God's holiness, but they are an offense to God's love. And it's because of that that God has set out on a mission to chase after us in Jesus Christ and bring us back home. Because his love will not be satisfied until we do come back home to the Father who wants us to call him Daddy. So we hear in these verses that God is delighted, so delighted, to reveal himself to anyone who will humbly draw near and the way that this happens is through that intimate family relationship between Jesus and God when, God, when Jesus draws us into that circle. So we've explored those first two questions. This passage tells us something about us as human beings, how we separate ourselves and become the critic when we're threatened instead of drawing near. And something about the God who says, no, be vulnerable, trust me to forgive and heal, draw close. And this gets us finally to those last verses that we love so much. And maybe we understand them with a little more depth now for having thought about what comes before. Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. God doesn't want us to take the supposedly easy way out of challenge or change or growth and become distant. Since the Garden of Eden, the choice has always been, shall we run away or shall we run to? <laughs> do we run away from God or do we run to God? God wants us to have our eyes open, acknowledge the mess, draw near, and see the truth of who God is, which includes his graciousness.
like those dust bunnies that I see when I get on the floor or the thorns I find when I get into those raspberries. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, but then suddenly things become possible because I also see my lungs, which gives me vision. I see fruit that is sweet and life-giving. Suddenly, life in God is opened up. So we need to be willing to go there, to hear God's call to repentance, to hear Jesus' assurance that you will find healing, that you will find forgiveness, that you will find new life. For God draws close to himself, not those who are perfect, not those who are untainted islands unto themselves. Who does God draw close to himself? Who is Jesus calling here? He is calling those who are weary, those who have been struggling and own their struggle. Jesus is calling those who are heavy laden, those who say, whoa, it's too long and this is too heavy, and I'm ready to give that up. It's interesting how Jesus praises that revelation. He says, you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding, and you reveal them to children, and this is your gracious will. And the reason that it's gracious is because the children, the ones who say, we're burdened, we want to grow, we want to be freed, um, are the ones uh, who receive that kind of mercy, the ones who are crying out for it. And this is the gospel, the mission of God. Some too, sometimes too often, even in the church, we can forget this. <clears throat> the church can be seen as a community of upstanding citizens instead of the place where we find grace. I remember one time going to church at First Pres, and I was walking a little bit late. I can't remember why, but um, I was by myself walking down the sidewalk. There's a woman right outside the church uh, who needed some help with some things, and um, I invited her in. I said, why don't we go in together and we'll worship and we'll work this out? And she said, are you kidding? I can't go in there. And my heart just broke because I understood what she meant. Like, I can't go in there. My life's a mess. I can't go in there. These clothes are a mess. I understood what she meant. I thought, oh, Jesus, forgive us that the church has become a place where you've got to have the right clothes, or you've got to pretend like you have it all together, when it's exactly the opposite who Jesus is calling here. And even in small ways, I'm convicted by this. Just yesterday, I was driving my daughter over to a friend's house to spend the night. Um, she's 14, and um, this morning she's singing Amazing Grace at First Pres. And as we're driving her over, um, I glanced down at her knee. And she really loves to sketch, and she loves to do ink stuff. And the day before, she had drawn this really fascinating, beautiful picture on her knee with Sharpie markers, <laughs> which are pretty permanent. And I'm sorry, it kind of annoys me. <laughs> Um, I started thinking, oh, standing up in church singing Amazing Grace this morning, and she's got a face drawn on her knee. And I started to say, have you been able to scrub off that? And then God, Beth, what are you doing? <laughs> the girl's getting ready to sing about God's amazing grace in the church, and you're about to start criticizing. Does she have ink on her knee? You're getting ready to preach about Jesus calling those who are weird. Just be quiet, Beth. Just say, God bless you as you sing about the grace of God and stop talking about the ink on her knee. So, if we're willing to become vulnerable, what does God do about our wretchedness? God who saves a wretch like me, our weariness, our burdenness. Where do we find our relief? We find it by joining Jesus, by stepping down off of our throne from on high, by stepping toward, by joining him, in his yoke. He wants us to be yoked with him, a yoke that's easy and light because it's life. He wants us to be with him. He wants me to be with him. He wants each one of you to be, to be with him, to be yoked with him. So a very simple application today for our sermon after all of this is a call to become vulnerable and to draw near and to be with Jesus. To join up with him in that yoke, which both acknowledges the messes in our lives and simultaneously relieves them, because when we are yoked with Jesus, who does the heavy lifting <laughs> in life then? Jesus is the one who bears the weight. We're just with him, with him, graciously, and that's right where he wants us to be. 
What are your burdens this morning? What are the sources of weariness that you have? In what areas are you trying to decide between running away or running toward God? Are there sources of suffering for which you need God to comfort you in your pain? Because maybe you cannot see the past the pain right now, but you want to. Are there areas of doubt where you need assurance or hope because you are just right on the edge of cynicism or maybe you've like already fallen over to that side? Are there areas of sin that you've not been able to acknowledge, but you can feel it back? There's like this little shadow just chasing you day to day, and you want it lifted. Is there strife or sorrow with family or coworkers in which you want peace and a new chapter? Is there a fear or sort of anxiety in your heart that's just eating away from what you want that? swept out and replaced by that peace that passes understanding. Today, as the worship team gets ready to lead us in our song, any of you have some of those that you're ready to say, all right, I'm done stepping back, waiting on the sidelines. I want to trust this to God. Please be welcome to come forward and glad to say a word of blessing and hope with you. But whether we come forward or not, as we think about this gospel word and take with us into this week, let each of us take a look at the thorns and the dust bunnies, at our weariness and our burdens, and decide to draw near to God as little trusting children to step into that yoke with Christ and to find our life there. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, you are so patient. Because again and again in life, we go through this exercise of running away from you right when we need you most. Thank you that every single morning, your mercies are new. Every single morning, your call is fresh. And what you say, come to me, join me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you will find rest. I pray for each one of us, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the assurance of your grace, you will draw us a little closer to yourself this day and that we will trust you with all of our hopes, our needs, our burdens, our, our sins, our illnesses, our fears. Trust us to give it all to you so that we might walk close to you this day and the days that follow. Pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.